Friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shodungi. I teach English at Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, Prince Anwar Sharod, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are in module 12. In this module, we are going to learn Middle English Alliterative Poetry. This module is written by Dr. Mohua Bhomik, who teaches English at Derosio College, Kolkata, West Bengal. Now friends, what are the objectives of this particular module? The objectives of this module are, what is alliterative poetry, features of alliterative poetry, examples of Middle English alliterative poetry under different heads. And we will also dis, uh, discuss at length about the implications of Middle English alliterative poetry with suitable illustrations. With this, you will have a fair bit of knowledge of Middle English literary traditions. Friends, the revival and resurgence of alliterative tradition of Anglo-Saxon literature can be observed around 1350. After remaining hidden for almost 200 years, the last known alliterative poem before the revival is Lemon Brut, which dates around 1190 AD. Then after a prolonged gap approximately between 1350 and 1400, several poems appeared in a particular meter which can be traced as a continuous development from the old 4-bit alliterative measure of Beowulf and Sineolf. It was the same metrical pattern, but the significant changes. Alteration was meant more for decorative purpose than for structural requirement. Since the line was turned into a unit and thought, for many poets, searching the later turned into a passion and alliteration occurred on three syllables in a half line or carried through consecutive lines. Majority of poems belonging to the alliterative revival belong to the north and northwest midlands, with a few exceptions like Perry's Plowman which came from the West Midland. Now, friends, there are several causes for this revival. The, con the conquest of Edward III in France worked as an impetus for the re-emergence of national self-consciousness. Moreover, English ousted French as the official language of the court and the school. Eventually, the parliament was opened in English language in 1362 AD. In the meantime, the different dialects of English language were going through a process of simplification. The language itself was getting rid of inflections and was tending to attain a universal status. However, it was quite natural on the part of the poets associated with this revival to give emphasis on the national form of verses following the alliterative tradition. The parliament opened in English language in 1362 AD. Different dialects of English language going through a process of simplification. As you understand by the process of simplification, reorganization of the language. The language getting rid of inflections and tending to attain a universal status that involving there is a neutralization of language from the part of the writers. Poets associated with this revival worked hard. There was tremendous emphasis on national forms of verse following the alliterative tradition. That means, repetition of a particular sound pattern in a particular format. Friends, now, let us talk about some important alliterative poems of the time. Number one, Pearl. Pearl is 
essentially a pearl in literature and it's the symbolic overtone in many contexts. Number two, purity. Number three, patience. Number four, Sir Gawain and Green Knight. These poems have been named accordingly to their positions in the manuscript. First three are religious, while the last one is an Arthurian romance. By the time you know what Arthurian romance is, but if we look into the stories of all three, four texts, we can easily understand the pattern, formation and the thematic outline that deal with the particular time given in the framework. Friends, among all these stories, no one can forget the contribution of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It is one of the most representative of all Middle English alliterative romances. It is one of the finest examples of Arthurian romances written in English. Much like French romance, it tells a story of its own sake. There is no moral preaching involved in the text, but there are some symbols used at different places. Poet excels in characterization, descriptive details, handling of plot and use of long lines. The lyrical elements were introduced, story element has connections with folklore, subjected to multiple allegorical interpretations. Sir Gawain and Green Knight and the Green Knight is considered to be the most fascinating among the Middle English allegorical romances. It is considered as a kind of story of its own sake. The lyrical element and its structural beauty are its internal ingredients that we talk about. The poet makes every effort to describe the knight thoroughly, his appearance, stature, dress, armor and the horse. He is a knight of gigantic stature, clad in green clothes and riding on a green foal. Wavy hair falls upon his shoulder and his head is hanging like a bush upon his breast. He is not betrothed to carry any shield or hamlet, rather holds a holy bow in one hand and in one X with engravings in green in the other. When he enters into the hall and casts his glance around, all the renowned knights keep marveling without uttering a single word, not all from fear but some from the courtesy. When King Arthur invites him to stay for some time in his court, he replies that he has come to challenge the gallant and chivalrous knights to strike him with an X and promises to come back in one year to hurl back the return stroke. When the knights are bewildered to listen to his speech and remain dumb, the green light laughs and explains. What is this King Arthur's house, the fame of which has spread through so many realms? Forsooth, the renown of the round table is re overturned by one man's speech. For all tremble of for dead without a blow, without a blow being struck. Being humiliated, King Arthur himself gets himself ready to face the challenge and seize the X. In the meantime, Sir Gawain, the nephew of the king, comes forward valiantly and seeks the king's permission to accept the challenge. The main adventure involved in the plot is the challenge of the exchange of blows between Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Consequently, Green Knight is beheaded by Gawain, but the former picks off his head and promises to return a similar blow to Gawain one year later at a green chapel. During his search for the green chapel, Gawain takes the refuge at a castle and is entertained by the lord and the lady of the castle. Every morning when the lord goes away for hunting, Gawain is tempted by the lady 
However, he retains his courtesy at the same time repulses her advances, but on, on the third day he accepts the green griddle which according to the lady Gawain would require during his encounter with the knight. Gawain is wounded, the, wounded three times at the green chapel by the green knight who reveals himself as the lord of the castle. The wound caused on Gawain's neck during his encounter with the knight is for the hiding of the truth about the griddle he received from the lady. Gawain being humiliated reproaches himself for truth and this he is returned to Arthur's court and tells the story for example of a moral failure not as a heroic exploit. There is an unmistakable sophistication in the grace of the narrative and the technical skill of narration. This is an example of a beautiful narration of the time. The alliterative mode the author it is another an important category of the Middle English alliterative poetry. Preserved in Lincoln Thornton manuscript, it is a retelling of the later portion of King Arthur's legend that we are familiar with. The story element of the poem is the adaptation of book L 9 and 10 of Geoffrey Amman Mounts, History of Kings of Britain. There are episodes like the round table inspired by Lemon Brut and Wessus Romandy Brut. It is a realistic representation of events and the chronicles of time. Now friends, what is the implication of the alliterative poems? Often the critics say they are the expressions of social protest. Under this head, the most remarkable example is the vision of William concerning Pierce the Plowman. It is by far the most exemplary representative text of the age. This poem exists in three different states, A text, B text and C text. By this, we can conclude with a note that Middle English alliterative poems have their own status in the literary tradition of the Middle English period. With a pre-knowledge of Middle English prose, romances, Arthurian texts, the role of the round table and other heroics, we can easily assess the importance and the versification of the Middle English poetry. The poetry is alliterative and it is a departure from the Anglo-Saxon alliterative poetry tradition. So, on the whole, Middle English alliterative poetry takes an important gamut of implication in the context of Middle English literature and language. Friends, do not go home without noting down the audiovisual links on the screen. Forests probably first arose in the Carboniferous Age, some 100 million years ago. The primeval forest would have been large, dark and dense with trees. No wonder that early man exploring its depths began to imagine spirits of the forest, a magic wood. Perhaps the strange shapes and elusive perfumes of the forest air 
inspired him to think that he was in the presence of awesome gods and demons. Throughout the history of myth, man has speculated about the reasons for nature's seasonal cycle. One of his greatest anxieties is that there may be a time when spring doesn't come and winter lasts forever. Nature's cycle of renewal and decay, life and death, provides the central theme for the tale of Sargawain and the Green Knight. Set in the wilds of medieval England, it seems to measure out man's insignificance when faced with the irrepressible powers of nature. One winter, at a banquet, the court of King Arthur was celebrating the dawn of a new year. Their festivities were interrupted by the appearance of a remarkable stranger. The stranger informed the court that he was the Green Knight and that he'd brought them a challenge. He invited any knight to strike his head from his shoulders. But there was one condition. If the Green Knight survived, the challenger must, one year later, submit himself to the same ordeal. A terrible silence followed, until Arthur's nephew, Gawain, stood up. Then, to the court's astonishment, the body of the Green Knight rose. He spoke to Gawain. Find me at the Green Chapel in twelve months' time, or forever be known as a coward. The year passed, and Gawain set out to meet his fate at the Green Chapel. His journey north was long and arduous. He prayed that he might find some place of comfort and shelter from the cold. He realized he'd lost his way, when by good fortune, his horse led him towards a magnificent castle. Once inside, Gawain was welcomed by the lively and hospitable owner. The Lord assured him that the Green Chapel was nearby and invited him to spend the time until New Year as his guest. The Lord's wife was voluptuous. She had all the fertile vibrancy of spring and she seemed eager to be a particular friend to Gawain. Gawain delighted in the comforts and pleasures of the castle, unaware that he was, at the same time, undergoing a devious test. Over the next three days, the Lord went out hunting in the wild woods, leaving Gawain in the castle. Later that morning, Gawain's beautiful hostess entered his chamber. To 
preserve his knightly honor, he resisted her advances by pretending to sleep. In doing so, Gawain passed the first stage of his test. The following day, the Lord set off in pursuit of ferocious wild boar, and once again his lady visited Gawain. This time her approach was a little more straightforward. But the gallant knight, determined and courteous, stood firm. Gawain had now passed the tests of both chastity and loyalty. The third day dawned. The Lord went off in search of the most cunning of prey, the fox. On this occasion, the mistress of the castle offered Gawain a green girdle. This he accepted not as a token of love, but because she told him it possessed magic powers and would protect him in his time of need. So, with fear and trepidation, Garwen went to face his doom. What he'd not realized was that the Green Knight was in fact the very same Lord who'd been his host. It was he who had commanded his wife to test Gawain. Gawain was allowed his life. His neck was grazed for accepting the girdle but he proved himself in all other ways worthy. The air became suddenly mild and spring brought the forest back to life. The seasonal rebirth of the forest goes to the heart of one of our most powerful yearnings, the craving to find in nature a consolation for our own mortality. Historically, the leafy head of the green man is an image of nature's powers of renewal. It symbolizes the irrepressible force of natural life. Gawain's contest with the green knight suggests that there needs to be a union between man and the natural world. Nature, the story tells us, commands our respect.